Okay, so this is the first of a series of talks we're going to have on Tuesdays this quarter. Um, so me and my grad students work on a subject called applied category theory, applying to a certain branch of mathematics to all sorts of different kinds of topics. And we got interested in being a bit more serious about trying to apply it to really practical things. And one thing that I'm very concerned about is uh, climate and environmental issues. And so I'll sort of kick off by talking about the relationship of mathematics to environmental issues. It will seem a little bit unsatisfying because I'll talk about all the huge environmental problems we face. And then I'll say some rather vague things about how mathematics might help. And so, so it won't seem as if the second part is like salt is matching up to the, with the problems posed by the first part. And that's just true. That's just, that's just the way it is. Um, uh, so a better way to think about the second part is it's me groping around to try to think about what mathematicians might do about these big problems that we're facing as a civilization. And then in the seminar, different students and uh, Christina, who's a postdoc, are going to give talks about different uh, applications of category theory to different practical topics. And hopefully those will actually help with this climate issue if we think about it harder. And the part of the, what we're trying to do this quarter is to actually think about it harder. So maybe by the end of the quarter, we'll have a better understanding of what we're doing than now. So the big news that everyone should know is that we've left the Holocene. The Holocene is a silly geological epic that means the present, which only people living at this moment in time would have bothered to make up, because it's a very thin sliver of a geological epic compared to other ones. You might say it's when, when humans started roam, roaming the Earth, approximately. Uh, but we've left that Holocene. It's after the present. Uh, apparently, and we've entered a new geological epoch, which is called the Anthropocene, named after the fact that this is the epoch when the biosphere is rapidly changing due to human influences. The, the atmosphere, the, even the geology, even the rocks uh, are changing uh, due to what we're doing. And global warming is what people love to uh, worry about these days for very good reasons. But I want to emphasize that it's just one aspect of this change, that humans are now dominating the biosphere. And I don't think you can solve global warming by itself. Or more precisely, even if you solve it by itself, you haven't really addressed the real issue. So part of why this is happening is sort of obvious. It's that human population has shot up. But why has human population shot up? Well, a lot of the reason why is the so-called second agricultural revolution happening around 1950 when people started uh, using, using modern agricultural methods to, uh, for example, artificial fertilizers to grow cr crops much more efficiently than it had been before. Uh, so technology is, is, the, is the cause of, of this population increase. And of course, then the population increase means a much more widespread use of the technology. So to a large extent, our civilization is powered by a very simple method of burning carbon. There, there is solar power, and there is wind power, and so on. And ideally, they will become extremely important. But if you look at the percentage of power which is currently being generated by all those means, it's puny. I can't remember what it is worldwide, but something like 3% or so. So, so we basically are a carbon burning civilization. And if you look at how it's gone, it basically started in, in earnest around 1850, the steam age, when people started uh, burning coal, which is this green line here, which matches the black line at first. Uh, as the method of powering our civilization. So things like railroads, uh, generating electric power later, and so on. And then as you can see, what happened is that later on, uh, petroleum, oil, became significant and has now surpassed 
coal in terms of how much carbon is being emitted, and then natural gas is, is kicking in and is and is and is the fastest climbing right now. So this is how many million tons of carbon we're burning each year. So it's about seven billion now. This only goes up to the year 2000. They continue to go up. So, so that's dramatically changed the atmosphere of the planet. It's just truly amazing. So this is a graph of the carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million by volume over the last 400,000 years or so. Um, and you'll notice that it goes up and down quite a lot. We're in an unusual period of the Earth's history in general. So the last few million years, we've been in an ice age, by which we mean going between glaciation and the opposite of glaciation. So, it's, so ice sheets come and go. In the warm periods, the carbon dioxide concentration is higher, about 250 to 300 parts per million. In the cold periods, when there are massive ice sheets over North America and uh, other such places, you see it's down to about 200. And you can see there are really dramatic uh, changes. And so the last ice age ha ended about 10,000 or 12,000 years ago, or 18,000, depending on when you start counting it as having ended. Uh, and it shot up, the carbon concentration shot up, carbon dioxide concentration shot up as it always does, and it takes us up to this usual height here. But then something completely different happened, which is that humans started building, burning uh, carbon that they dug up out of the ground, and that's this further nearly vertical part of this chart, which shows that we've just shot ourselves out of the usual cycle into some new realm. And this is so amazing that I can just look at this graph and tell that this graph is old because now it's over 400 parts per million. So I was like, I don't know, this graph might be like 10 years old. So we're looking at like geological time and slow processes, but then there's some, some amazing uh, rapid process imposed by humans, which you can, you can see expanded out, expanded out here over the last uh, thousand years. So this graph only goes up to 2,000. And the increase in carbon dioxide goes along with the increase in temperature of the planet due to the greenhouse effect, the whole holding in of, of infrared light. And here's a reconstruction of the Earth's temperature using lots of different records, 73 different records. Uh, and you can see that the last ice age, the last glacial cycle, ended around 10,000 years ago. So it was warming up. It reached its the peak of temperature around 6,000 years before present. That's what BP means. Present, by the way, in geology is 1950. 1950 is defined to be the present. So it's after the present. Uh, and, and this is also stands for before Presley, because this is like when Elvis was, was there. That's, a, that's another geologist joke. Uh, so, so, but the peak was around, around 6,000. Then we were actually starting to cool down again, and there would have eventually been another glacial cycle. But we've, we've completely disrupted that. As you can see, it's, the temperature is shooting up vertically now. And in fact, a lot of geologists and climate scientists think that we basically managed to postpone the next glacial cycle for about 10,000 years or, or more because carbon dioxide, once it's put into the air, lasts for a long time, thousands of years. So even if we stop putting out carbon dioxide now, it's not going to bring this temperature down for another many thousands of years. That's the insidious thing about it. So, Maybe all of you know this, but it's important to know and to tell everybody that, that, that uh, for example, if we just stop increasing the amount of carbon dioxide we burn, we, say we won't keep burning more, that's useless. That just means that we're not making things worse even faster every year. It means that we're making things worse at a constant rate. 
if we completely stop burning all carbon, which the United Nations now urges that we do by 2050, that doesn't mean that things are going to get better. It just means that things are going to be the same, and then slowly, over thousands of years, get better. But at least they won't get worse. This has had huge effects on our biosphere, and one of the most amazing to me is that the amount of ice in the Arctic is much less now than when I was a kid. I hadn't expected when I was a kid that I was living in a different geological epic than I was, than I would be when I uh, grew up. But here you can see the <coughs> volume in cubic kilometers of ice in the Arctic. This is the minimum volume, the minimum each year, which is, happens around September. And you can see it was going down. They were really worried in 2008. And then it went up, and some people said, yay, it's getting better, but not really much. So, so basically, it's gone down by a factor of about roughly three. So we have about a third as much ice up there as we, as we did. Of course, you could say, who cares? I don't really want there to be lots of ice up in the Arctic anyway. Um, but the thing is, it does affect weather patterns. And a lot of the strange kinds of weather that we've been having in winter in the United States has to do with the fact that now the Arctic is not all frozen. So that you may have heard about this polar vortex that they were complaining about in Chicago, or basically the weather that normally was at the North Pole moved over to Chicago, so it became super cold. That's a, no one, that's a mysterious kind of thing, but people think that those kind of changes are, and the other kinds of changes are due to the fact that now we have this uh, ocean, more ocean in the Arctic than we ever did. So it has effects outside the Arctic itself. itself. But now I want to say what I said before, which is that Global warming is just one portion of the overall picture. And you can't really ignore the rest. People tend to try to ignore the rest. So right now, about one quarter of all the chemical energy produced by plants absorbing sunlight is being used by humans. So basically what this means is that you can't think of humans as like a small perturbation on the surface of the Earth, a small thing. We're a big thing, and we keep getting bigger. We now take more nitrogen out of the air and convert it into nitrates than all other processes combined. So, so trees often have uh, fungi in their roots which fix nitrogen. They take nitrogen from this inactive form from the air and turn it into nitrates which then can be used. Yes? For that first one, are you saying that uh, like one quarter of the energy that plants produce are that plants have produced in the past, did you say? No, no, no. Currently, oh, okay. now, if you like, look at all the plants, see how much chemical energy they're they're creating. That is, you know, they absorb sun and they turn create starches and sugars and things like that, which are store stored energy. About one quarter of that is stuff that we are eating, or maybe like harvesting for lumber and other purposes like that. So that's how much of the and because plants are like the first receivers of, of, of energy from the sun, this is, this is a way to sort of keep track of, of how much of the biosphere we have commanded, we've taken control of in terms of energy flow. And in terms of nitrogen flow, we have more than half. What happened was that this famous uh, German chemist Haber invented a, a process that uses electricity to create nitrates out of nitrogen and this is what we use for fertilizer now. So we're using oil and other things to power the Haber process to create nitrate for fertilizer. And that agricultural revolution I mentioned in 1950, where the population suddenly shot up, was because now people can grow a lot more plants because we use this process. You mean that uh, more than all other processes that have nitrogen as a reactant, or all the other ways of converting nitrogen to nitrates? The latter, yeah. Mm -hmm. What else converts nitrogen to nitrates? I was saying that like plant, a lot of plants have fungi in their roots which fix, fix nitrogen. So, so plants need nitrates and, uh, to grow, and that's why we 
fertilize them, but they uh, can fertilize themselves, so to speak, by, by capturing nitrogen out of the air. But they do it often with the aid of, of fungi, mycorrhizae, or they're called. It's a symbiotic thing. Uh, some of them are better at that than others. Um, phosphorus is another really important uh, chemical for fertilizing plant growth. And we dig up a lot of phosphates from the ground and make fertilizer out of them. Uh, but unfortunately, our processes uh, let a lot of the fertilizer get washed away into rivers. And so now, eight or, the amount of phosphates going into the oceans from rivers is eight or nine times higher than it had been before we started massively fertilizing things. Uh, and so that's another situation where we're like dramatically changing the chemical flow of, of things. I should point out that part of why these are, are, are a problem is that um, both the nitrates and the phosphates get washed into the oceans and then you get this process called eutrophication where algae blooms suck all the oxygen out of the water and you get these things called dead zones. So for example, the Gulf of New Mexico, uh, large portions of that body of the water, fish just can't breathe in there because all the oxygen has been, been sucked out. Um, and, and basically, uh, harbors all around the world suffer from that eutrophication. And so for all sorts of reasons, but mainly habitat loss, uh, the rate of species going extinct is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times the usual background rate. This is an extremely hard number to estimate, which is why it's a factor of 10 uh, ambiguity in there. So, so the people who say, ah, don't worry, it's not a problem, say, ah, it's just 100 times higher than normal. Or the people say, like, no, it's really bad. They're the ones who think it's 1,000 times. But, but those are both quite large. It's very hard to count species, of course, and it's, so it's hard to estimate this. But, but there are other things that we can estimate more easily. It's easy to keep track of certain kinds of animals and large ocean fish are things that people actually go out of their way to catch so people can keep track of them. And so it's a fact, a very sad fact, that populations of large ocean fish have declined 90% since 1950 due to overfishing. That's not habitat loss, that's fishing, overfishing. Um, and recent, uh, recent research has really shown how serious this is. Um, a really important report by the World Wildlife Fund uh, as, as keeping track of the abundance of all sorts of animals. These are vertebrates, so like fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, and birds. They kept track of the average abundance, that is the total number of uh, 4,005 different species. Well, not all of them everywhere, but a bunch of populations of them, so they look in different regions. And they've seen that since 1970, the abundance of all these species has dropped by 60%. So, so that, that, that's a major change in the number of uh, living animals on the planet. And there have been recent things about insects, which are really even more shocking. Uh, the butterflies, or Lepidoptera, have gone down, I guess, by like 30%, but other types of of, of invertebrates, so insects and spiders mainly, have dropped a lot. Like, so this is like, I guess, down to, I don't know what, 25%. Uh, so it's dropped to one quarter of its level from 1970 to 2010. And there's been some recent research in forests in Germany and in a rainforest in Puerto Rico where, where biologists like carefully counted the, uh, the biomass, the amount, the amount of insects both back in 1970 and recently, and they've discovered like 80% or 90% declines in those populations. And part of why that's scary is because no one really knows exactly why it's happening. Um, it could be due to pesticides. It, for, the, for the Puerto Rico, they think it's due, due, to, due to global warming, that those are quite hot regions and that just a little bit of extra warming may be what makes these species not do so well. <coughs> so it's not just other types of species that are suffering from this, of course. We've been seeing recently how it's really kicking in. The climate change is really having an impact on human activities. And I'm not going to give you a long litany of all the things that are going on, but just a few. So 
2017, this uh, fire that, that uh, hit Santa Rosa and other places. This is, was once a city here. Uh, it was the second most destructive fire in the history of California. In 2017, in August, Hurricane Harvey uh, hit um, um, Houston and, and uh, neighboring areas in, in Louisiana, and it was the costliest hurricane on record. This is a picture of the amount of water that fell in that hurricane. Of course, luckily it didn't all fall in the form of one single droplet like this, <laughs> uh, or else Houston would not exist, but it, it's just amazing. And, and it's known that that is due to global warming because, because the strange behavior of that hurricane that made it so damaging was due to the fact that the water in the Gulf, course, Gulf Coast, the waters off the Gulf Coast down there, were much warmer than normal. So there's a lot more evaporation of, of water. And the hurricane just sort of hung around there instead of moving inland rapidly. And, and it was able to drench a lot of communities. So these are things we should be expecting to continue to happen now we have this new climate. And I'm sure you remember this one. So this year, in 2018, in November, we had the deadliest fire in the United States since 1918. This town of Paradise was demolished. So, and I could, I could go on. I'm only mentioning ones in the United States just because you're more likely to be aware of those. But if you actually look at what has happened in places like Pakistan, it's much worse. So, OK, so my point is not to just make you miserable in the press. But, but to real, point out that these changes that are, we're, we're encountering now, it, they're not really what you'd call problems of, this, of the normal political sort, where you're like, you know, OK, there's a problem. We set up a bureaucracy to solve that problem. And then it's solved, and then we're OK. Um, we could, first of all, climate, climate change is so big, it, it's, it's, it's threatening our, our institutions uh, even if our institutions militated to rapidly solve these problems, which they're not, uh, it, would be, it would be really dramatic sort of shifts. As I said, we would be involved completely uh, ending uh, all carbon emissions by around 2050. It would be like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, but, but the point is that that's, even that would just be a portion of what's going on, because all these other things I'm mentioning are also happening. And so we have to realize that it's not just a problem. It's part of a, of a change from some phase of, of history to some very different phase. It's a shift from when human populations were small and they were able to exponentially grow, and we didn't have to worry too much about the effects of that exponential growth, to some new phase where it's reaching some kind of a limit and so we have to completely rethink everything about our culture, which was based on those old assumptions. So before, we could treat nature as different from civilization. So civilization's our little town here. Nature is all the wilderness out there. We still act like that. But that's not the way it is anymore. There is no such thing as nature anymore that's separate from civilization. We are the most of, we're dominating the world. And, and as you can see, we're, we're, we're having major effects on nature. So there's like there's no wild land somewhere that's like unaffected by human behavior. It's all heavily affected by, by human behavior. So, so one thing that means is that we have to really recognize that we are part of nature. We're, there's no separation, really. You could pretend that it was that way before, but it's not. Okay, so we are nature now, and we are also civilization, and we have to get used to that way of thinking, which has a lot of effects. And before, you could think of economic growth as the main goal of society. We're just trying more of everything, the more of everything there is, the happier everybody will be. This is still, of course, how politicians talk all the time. They say, like, Oh no, you couldn't stop global warming. That would lessen economic growth. We need jobs. Well, we may need jobs, but we don't necessarily need economic growth because economic growth, uh, I mean, it has its good side, but it has its equally flipped bad side, which is all of these things which I've been discussing here. 
So just simply growth in the sense of war of everything is, is not, doesn't make sense anymore. And so many forms of growth are actually pushing our biosphere towards various tipping points, points at which like, things can really start to, to fail. Uh, so if you have like, massive crop failures due to droughts, you can say, whoops, we grew a little bit too much. <clears throat> okay, so that's the issue, that's the situation we're in. So what can we do about this? First of all, like, what can everybody do about this? And then I'll talk about, a bit about mathematicians, because this is a math talk, believe it or not. It's a weird kind of math talk. <laughs> so, um, so the first thing I'd say is sort of obvious is pay attention and study the environmental consequences of your actions. The basic idea of like behaving in blissful ignorance of, of the consequences of our actions is, is out. It's just like that's not, we can't do that anymore. Um, and adjust your actions accordingly. For example, there's, you can compute your carbon footprint. These slides are online, and if you click on that thing there, that link in green, you get taken to a little online website where you can calculate the carbon emissions caused by all sorts of activities. So if you say like, you know, I drive to work 20 miles every day, and I've got this kind of car, it'll just tell you how much carbon you're emitting from that activity. Or if you say, I want to fly somewhere, it'll tell you that. And it's just good to know, it's just good to know what, what's what. Uh, part of, part of why, it's, why it's good to know this is because if you, if you don't know this stuff, you may be spending a lot of work trying to change certain behaviors that have very little impact while you're like neglecting some other things you can do that could have a huge impact. So for example, changing to better light bulbs is nice, but, but, but not taking a single air trip is like tons nicer. Um, so it's just good to know. So we have, this is not, however, a problem that we can solve just by adjusting our individual behavior. It's a collective action problem. So we have to work with groups and politicians who take these issues seriously. We have to vote for them, we have to work with them, we have to yell at them sometimes to make them do things better. So recently in the United States, there's been an idea floating around called the Green New Deal, which is an attempt to try to create a program that's simultaneously helping <clears throat> the poorer folks of us who are not getting all the benefits of the, of the economic system and tackle these environmental issues. If you start reading about it, you'll see that there are, there are policymakers who are really trying to figure out exactly how this Green New Deal should work. It's still up for grabs at this, at this point, but there are, there are some policy wonks in Washington, D.C. who are trying to like, figure out what, what, what could be involved, and I think that's, that's really important. Um, it's, 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 it's very new. It's not formed yet, uh, so one could have some impact on it. And finally, I'd say tilt every of your activities a little bit toward dealing with the Anthropocene. <clears throat> so everybody has certain skills and talents that could help. And you can do a lot of it as part of your existing job. So some of you are mere students, so you don't have jobs yet exactly, but that's, that's still actually a type of job. And certainly by the time you actually start <coughs> working in a, in a paid job, you can do a lot. Even Definitely, as being a, a teaching assistant, you can you can have a lot of a lot of effect by because you're actually teaching people and you can tell them about things that that are some of these things I've been mentioning here that a lot of people don't know. So you see, when I started out thinking about this stuff, I thought <clears throat> that maybe I should completely switch from being a mathematician to something else that was more useful. And it's certainly true that there are like lots of things that could, in principle, be more useful than, than being a mathematician for this, for this stuff. Um, like, I think like being a good politician could be incredibly useful, or all sorts of other things. But, but I quickly realized that I wasn't going to be able to make that dramatic a shift in my career. It's just a psychological thing. I just didn't feel up to it. Um, and so for a while, I was trying to work on mathematics of climate science. Uh. 
But I realized, unfortunately, that I'm so old and stodgy that that particular kind of mathematics, it's not the kind of mathematics I feel good at. Climate science is, is incredibly complicated in the sense that you're trying to understand the Earth system, which is a very complicated system. <clears throat> Whereas the kind of mathematics I got good at was studying very simple contained problems where there's not much data involved and where you're just like coming up with some beautiful formulas or some beautiful math concepts. <clears throat> and so I realized that yes, I could become a second rate climate scientist or I could try to continue being like a first rate, one and a half rate uh, mathematician. And so I, I realized that um, I, it actually probably pays to do something I was good at. But, but I think it was, pop, I think, so what I've been trying to do is to stick with what I'm good at, but turn it around a little bit so that it has something to do with solving these problems. In particular, I'd been doing a lot of mathematics associated to string theory and quantum gravity and beautiful mathematical subjects having to do with physics. And I said, well, maybe I can try to be, do beautiful mathematics associated to biology or ecology or electrical engineering or chemistry. I believe that those subjects are worthy subjects of deep mathematical thought, just like particle physics is but there's just less of a tradition of mathematicians talking to people in those other areas. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to build up the level of mathematical expertise. I mean, so mathematicians have been talking with physicists at least since Newton, I mean, obviously before that, but, but by the time you got around to Newton, you got someone who said like, hey, I'm gonna make up some whole new kind of math called calculus, and I'm gonna do it so that now you can like predict how things move. And that was sort of part of the basis of the Industrial Revolution. The, the classical mechanics and thermodynamics are the basis of the Industrial Revolution of like the 1800s. So, so, so ever since then, there's been this strong interaction between mathematics and physics and the applications because they say, hey, it probably pays for you guys to study this abstract nonsense because look, it led to steam engines and electrical power and then later on, quantum mechanics, which gives you lasers and, and semiconductors and so on. Whereas with biology, which is the real vibrant science of the 20th century, there's not such a long history of mathematics connecting to biology. And so I think that's, that's so I, I've, tr so basically I'm trying to shift towards something that I'm good at, Sorry, stick with something I'm good at, but shift the direction of it a little bit. And I think everybody can do that. You don't need to be a mathematician or anything. So like if you're a carpenter, there's tons of stuff you can do to improve energy efficiency in homes. Or you know, if you're a lawyer, there's tons of stuff you can do. No matter what you're doing. I realized my wife was saying, well, what about if you're like working a crummy job where they just tell you what you got to do and you have no free will, uh, free choice at all? And I, I agree that... that um, that for people who are just basically essentially you know, just working to earn a living with very little freedom, then, then of course they don't have much ability to affect things in their day job, but they can still do things outside their day job. And probably even in their day job too. I think everyone has freedom for action. Okay, so a bunch of you are mathematicians. That's the, a bunch of you are not, but, but, but what can mathematicians do? Let's talk about mathematicians for a bit. So there are two easy things that mathematicians can do. So one is that mathematicians can teach math better than they do now. Now I say that's easy because, just for the reason that most math is taught so badly that it, it seems like it should be easy to do better than that. <laughs> but on the other hand, maybe it's not so easy because if it was so easy, why would everyone be doing it so badly? I don't know. But I, I, I think it's possible to rather easily teach math much better than, than average. Uh, because most mathematicians don't really think about teaching all that seriously. They don't, they don't think about the human aspect of teaching. Now, I, I'm leaving out everyone in this room who, of course, is an excellent teacher. But, well, but as for myself, I, I went into mathematics because I like mathematics. And then I said, oh, what can you do in mathematics? Oh, you can teach. Okay, I'm going to teach. But I, the, I didn't start out 
caring about, about teaching and, and communication. And it took a while for me to realize, hey, that's what you're actually doing when you're, when you're teaching. You're, 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 you're dealing with people. So it's all about people, not about mathematics. So these days I have all sorts of pieces of advice about teaching, most of which I won't give, but the one I will give is like when you're teaching a subject and you're standing up there in front of the people, you should not be thinking about that subject. If your brain is full of thoughts about that subject, you're ignoring the reality of the people looking at you and talking to you. You should have already thought about it, the subject enough so you don't have to think about it anymore. Teaching is basically a form of acting. You're standing on a stage, right? You don't want to have an actor like thinking about his lines or something like that. You have to be there. And I think the other important thing is you can instill a love of mathematics. Well, this is a two-part thing, which I should have separated out. The first thing is I think the most important thing is to instill a love of mathematics. If you get people to love mathematics, and this applies to any subject, not just mathematics, then they will learn it, and then they will learn it when they need to know it. So if you love mathematics and you don't know some formula, it doesn't matter. You just look up the formula on Wikipedia, and because you love mathematics, you'll understand it when you need it. If you don't like mathematics, you're just sort of doomed. You're never going to really learn it. You're going to like say, oh, I've got to memorize this junk, but it'll, you'll forget it as, as soon as possible. So I think that the whole idea of mathematics is like teaching a whole bunch of facts. You've got to know these facts. It, it's basically mis, misguided. And then on the flip side, once you get people loving mathematics, then there's another danger that occurs, which most mathematicians fall into, which is that they get lost in this beautiful world of mathematics. That's what I mean by letting students get lost in its dream world. All of my grad students here and me probably know about that, uh, that danger. That mathematics is so much fun. Everything is so much more perfect in mathematics than in normal reality. that. That, that it's just easy to like space out and not think about other things like climate change. You tend to think like, oh yeah, that's so messy. How am I ever gonna deal anything with, with a messy real world? So somehow you have to instill a love of mathematics while letting people see that they can use it to do things in the real world. That's the hard part, I guess, the combination. So uh, the easy way to try to do a little bit of that is that you can use real world examples to illustrate important lessons. Instead of just doing math problems in your calculus class that are about completely artificial, boring situations about farmers trying to build a fence that maximizes the area of something, try, 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 some, try thinking of something new. So for example, we love talking about exponential growth in mathematics. It's the simplest differential equation that's sort of interesting, but it's really important to realize that no growth is forever exponential. And you can tweak those exponential equations to show what reality, a little bit more about what reality is like. So for academics, and this is not just for mathematicians, this is for all academics, if you want to cut your carbon footprint, take one less plane trip. That will be good. So for example, a round trip flight from LAX to Heathrow emits 1.5 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. How much does that really amount to? Well, if you look, take people worldwide and you look at the average carbon emission, they put out about 5 tons of carbon dioxide, or 4.8 tons. So basically, that one flight that you're taking to Europe, round trip, is equal to about one third of the total carbon budget of an average person. And of course, the carbon budget of an average person is not some goal, it's a goal to aspire to for Americans, because Americans are much more than this. We're like about, I forget what, but much more than this. But, but even so, the average uh, carbon emissions, that's what's creating the, the global warming problem. So, the, so that even getting down to this level, which would be a real triumph for most Americans, uh, is still, still just a start. So unfortunately, in academia, the basic idea is we're not going to pay you very much, but you get to have summers to travel around and go to conferences and all these fun places. And so that will placate you for your low salary so that you don't like go to Wall Street. You'll, you'll still feel like a big shot because you're like going here and going there. But unfortunately, that way of paying people 
is basically paying people with carbon emissions. <laughs> That's what they're doing. <laughs> so we, we, have to, we have to somehow figure out ways to be cool and have fun without running around all over the place all the time. I think we should do something like have a conference that lasts a month. Wherever you are with the people there, where you just like hang out and have fun. <laughs> you can, there are lots of ways to have fun without traveling around. I do too much traveling around. I'm very guilty of this. This is my, this makes me feel very guilty. Okay, and one hard thing, which is invent the math we need for life on a finite planet. We need to rethink <coughs> everything. We need to rethink technology. We need to rethink uh, agriculture. We need to rethink economics. We need to rethink politics to accept the fact that we're living on a finite-sized planet and so that exponential growth cannot be the normal condition. And that involves new mathematics, as well as new everything else. So, I think we can dream up a lot of interesting new mathematics by pondering complexity of ecosystems just as well as we could from more traditional ways of getting our hands on interesting mathematics. I used to love, still do love particle physics. This is a Feynman diagram describing some particles colliding with each other and turning into some other particles. I became enthralled with these even when I was young, but I became even more enthralled with them when I realized that this is a picture of amorphism in a symmetric monoidal category which is a name, fancy way to say that you can stick these things together to get bigger ones, and they obey some very nice rules, and that we're basically describing the processes in nature with this branch of math called category theory. That's great. That was like the big news in the 1990s. Hey, category theory is relevant to particle physics. But what's the big news now? Well, I guess the big news is that everything else is described by category theory too. Um, so these ecologists wrote, to understand ecosystems ultimately will be to understand networks. That was their dream. This is a picture by a guy named Odom of an ecosystem. And I guess it's a little hard to see, but it's showing flows of various quantities, um, mainly uh, energy, which are these dark lines like coming from the sun and the wind, and water which is coming from the rain and so on and going out. And those are just two uh, approximately conserved quantities, right? Energy is conserved, water is approximately conserved. And so the good thing about conserved quantities is that you can track them, you can keep track of them. They don't disappear, they don't appear out of nowhere. So you can understand a complicated system a little bit more easily by focusing on those conserved quantities. And so, so uh, Odom has these very, nice books where he studies ecosystems in this kind of way and draws analogies with electrical circuits. If you notice this thing, this may, if you know electrical circuit diagrams, this is like a ground where electricity can, can, can go out of an electrical circuit. So pondering the, the relationship of that picture to the Feynman diagram picture, I realized that engineers and chemists and biologists and many other kind of scientists use lots of different diagram languages to describe networks. Here's an electrical circuit. This is like an amplifier or a boom box. This is a, a, a diagram showing the uh, re things that occur in the infection of the white blood cells by the human immunodeficiency virus, the virus that causes AIDS. The different kinds of processes occur like a, a virus and a white blood cell meets and turn into an infected white blood cell and so on. This type of diagram here is called a Petri net. They were invented uh, for purposes of chemistry, but widely used by computer scientists. But they're also starting, they're also used in these models of biological processes. This thing here is a very abstractified chemical reaction network. This is like a mathematician's idea of chemistry, right? So chemists know that chemicals have different names. But mathematicians don't know what those names are, so they might call them A, B, C, D. So this is a chemical reaction network where various kinds of chemicals can turn into other chemicals. 
And it turns out there's a really beautiful branch of mathematics where you study the differential equations that describe these chemical reactions by looking at the diagrams and, and, and you can conclude information about the solutions of the differential equations from the topology of the diagrams. Um, and there's also a nice fact that you can convert any Petri net into one of these things or vice versa. So these are just alternate outlooks on, on processes where things of various kinds turn into things of various kinds. This thing here is called a signal flow diagram. It's a type of diagram that shows up in a branch of engineering called control theory, where you're trying to control some process by means of feedback loops and so on. So since I got back from Singapore in 2012, I've been taking on a bunch of grad students to work on all these kinds of subjects and to unify them all using category theory. And the idea is to try to build up a language for dealing with, with complex networks, or as you like to call them, open systems, systems where stuff flows in and flows out. And they are morphisms in a category, which just means that you can compose them to get bigger ones. And the idea here is to try to build up some kind of new, sort of more unified science that that draws insights from electrical engineering, and from biology and chemistry and control theory uh, to basically try to get our science up to the, get it up to speed, get, get it up to the level uh, where it's using the mathematics that we now have available so that we can do some better stuff in dealing with all the problems that we're facing. So, yeah, so, I, so in this time period, since I got back, we've been working on various things, signal flow graphs, I mentioned from control theory, and electrical circuit diagrams, and the relationship of those two. Um, Petri nets and chemical reaction networks, and the relationship of those two. So there are lots of papers on these things that our gang has written by now. Um, Bayesian networks and information theory, no one here is, was so much involved in that, but uh, Brendan Fong, uh, wrote a beautiful paper on Bayesian networks, which are now widely used in machine uh, learning. And Tobias Fritz and I worked on information theory from a category theory point of view. What's, uh, what's that one about? Yeah, Let's see if I can read it. Uh, this, it's been so long since I've used this. So this is basically a vague idea of like different variables affecting each other. So greenhouse gas emissions can affect the global warming rate which can affect this, which can affect this, which can affect this. And so this may be like too vague to be a very practical Bayesian network, but the idea of a Bayesian network is that you have a bunch of blobs which describe various variables, and then arrows describing causal links between them. And you want to like to you can quantify the amount that one variable affects the value of another variable. And you could try to infer these causal links if you started out not having them. Um, there's Alex. Kissinger is a guy who was like the Applied Category Theory 2018 uh, conference. He's talking about inferring uh, causal links between variables uh, using ideas from category theory. So these things that we've been doing, which are very focused on networks, is really just the tip of some larger iceberg, which could be called Applied Category Theory, trying to apply this branch of math called Category Theory to practical issues. And so what's been going on is we've been starting a series of conferences on applied category theory. And the second one will happen in Oxford <coughs> this summer. And also a school, that is a, a research school for grad students. And also a journal <coughs> called Compositionality to try to, try to bring category theorists through these very smart, but very abstract-minded mathematicians into contact with new kinds of applications of mathematics. But applied category theory is just one tiny bit of the different kinds of math we need to understand such things as biology, ecosystems, and social systems. I'm not trying to say that like category theory is the solution to the world's problems. So the, the, the issue is more like, I'm trapped in being a category theorist. That's what I'm good at. OK, now what can I do? Do applied category theory. <laughs> so, so uh, there are 
other applied mathematicians in, in the department, like Mark Albert, who are working on, on biology and mathematics, and they are much more involved with the actual applications to biology. It makes all the stuff I'm doing look very up in the air. So I'm not trying to uh, say the category theory is thing, but I think it will, if we develop it, will bring in some new insights into things that other people can't have. So in this seminar, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring in more applications, bring in more questions into, into our, our study. We, we've, I think we've been doing really well in the last couple of years <coughs> setting up a kind of language of networks. We have some papers cooking away uh, trying to do that. But, but now I think we're ready to try some new things. So we're going to have different talks in the coming, uh, coming weeks, on Tuesday at this time, in this place. Um, so Jonathan Oran there is visiting us from Switzerland. And he's been working on problems in symplectic linear algebra from a sort of category theoretic point of view. That's, I guess, why he's, that's why he would, He's here, maybe. Uh, so these are some papers he's written about categories where the morphisms are connected to symplectic linear algebra. If you don't know what symplectic linear algebra is, you could say it's the kind of linear algebra that shows up when you're studying classical mechanics. Relationships between positions of parts in a machine, a classical machine made of levers and gears and things would be not just any old type of relation, but a very special kind of relation called a, called a canonical relation. Uh, and so we'll talk about this kind of thing. And I've been trying to lure him into more applied things. So he and I are working on a project connected to chemistry right now. Uh, so then the next week, Christina, back there, the Silicopoulou is going to give a talk called Systems as Wiring Diagram Algebras. So before she was here, she was at various other places, including MIT, where David Spivak is. And David Spivak is one of the big guys in applied category theory. And so she'll talk about some of her work with him on that. In particular, we've been developing this approach for thinking of, of uh, systems as, of all sorts, like these kind of things, as morphisms in a category. David Spivak has a somewhat different outlook on the same problem, using the operat of wiring diagrams. And so Christina will tell us about that, and we'll try to figure out how it's all connected. Part of, I mean, we won't try to do that during her talk, but we're having, we're having meetings as well. And we'll, so she'll get us started and we'll work on it in our meetings. Um, so I guess the main <coughs> paper she'll be talking about is this one, dynamical systems of sheaves. But not so much the sheaves, but more about other things. Um, Daniel Sakala there is going to talk about social contagion. <coughs> modeled <laughs> on random networks. So there's a whole branch of math called network science, where they, which is somehow different from the kind of stuff I mainly do with networks, where you look at, where you look at a graph and you do different things with it. And one kind of thing you do with it is you look at like little guys, or little bits of information running around on the graph, like Facebook people sending messages to each other and receiving messages. And, and I, my impression is that Daniel, that I'm, just, I may be, I'm just making this up. This is like a story. I'll just like, I'll tell you what, what you're doing. But it doesn't need to be true. It just needs to be a good story. So Daniel, OK, I'll just do that. Daniel has decided that, I, well, it's definitely true whether or not he's decided it, that, that a lot of the problems we're facing have to do with communication and social behavior of people, right? So well, we're in this funny situation where like all the scientists know we should be desperately dealing with global warming, but the politicians seem to be living like in some completely different world where they're all talking to each other and they just say like, okay, what we should be doing about 
really doing is arguing about a border wall right now. That's what we should like to mean the main focus of American politics right now. So there's some kind of disconnects going on, and it, and also some kind of interesting spread of ideas through networks which are involved. And so people are studying the mathematics of that, and I guess Daniel will talk a bit about, about that. And that's really important. It's possible that the real solution to global warming has almost nothing to do with climate, climate science and almost everything to do with human behavior, because we're the ones actually, of course, who are making it happen. Uh, so Jay is going to talk about a paper called Backprop as Functor, a Compositional Perspective on Supervised Learning. This is written by David Spivak, who I mentioned, but also my former student, Brendan Fawn, who is over there at MIT now working with David Spivak. And backpropagation is a really important idea in machine learning, which is all the rage these days. And basically, backpropagation means that your, some information comes from the outside world, your brain or your artificial neural network starts processing it, processing it, processing it, but then it should send back some information to the front to establish some kind of feedback behavior that makes it do something more interesting. That's like an incredibly vague description. Uh, but, but it turns out that you can actually study this quite nicely using category theory where you think of this whole learner, this whole system that is like the input, the processing, the feedback, and the final output as a morphism which is a thing you could stick onto another thing of that sort and try to build bigger systems from that. <clears throat> One interesting thing about this, I'd say, is that I told, so Brendan is now writing a paper with David on more pure category theory. And I was telling him, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be working on this applied stuff. It's more important. And he said, and I said, like, for example, you should be working on this. You've got like this new insight into machine learning you should be like running with it. You can become famous, you do something great. Uh, and he said, yeah, well, I just don't know enough about machine learning to know what to do next. So I think there's some untapped potential in this, in this paper. But Brendan is also maybe a little bit too modest or something, because he wrote this paper on, on Bayesian networks and category theory for his master's thesis. And I told him, come on, I'll publish that, publish that. He said, well, no, that paper really didn't do anything. It's not really that good. And now everyone is citing that paper as like the start of this categorical approach to Bayesian networks. So, so I tell him, I keep telling him, <laughs> you're great, you gotta do more of the same stuff. But anyway, maybe you won't, maybe we need to do it. So maybe we should figure out like what we can do with machine learning using this idea. Just any one next step. It's just like, you don't need to solve everything. It's like one more thing. If you do like five things, there's so many people running around trying to do things in machine learning, then they'll just like take over and do it, and then they can say, bye, you go off and do your thing. Um, next, Christian will talk about the pi calculus towards global computing. So Robin Milner invented this framework called the pi calculus to try to formalize distributed concurrent computation. So in the old days of Turing and von Neumann, a computer was a little box that would calculate. You put in some question, you know, out pops the answer. And there's a whole bunch of mathematics that sort of modeled on that, trying, trying to mathematically describe that kind, that kind of uh, computer. But that's not really what's going on anymore. Right now, there are millions of computers, called cell phones, that are constantly <laughs> communicating with each other, sending information across channels that can come and go. Like when I'm talking to you, there's like a, you have a communication channel, that like when I stop talking to you, it goes away somewhere. Uh, and so we need a mathematical language for describing computation of that sort. It's spread out all over the place, all happening simultaneously, and we're people get to decide whether they're not going to, or agents get to decide whether they're not, not going to communicate with each other. So Milner, who is not a category theorist at all, he's a computer scientist, made up this intriguing and, to me, mysterious 
formalism called the pi calculus to try to elegantly capture the idea of the, the most elegant way of capturing how a single lone computer, like running one program, works is called the lambda calculus. And so Turing had invented Turing machines, which are like an abstract mathematical way of talking about hardware. But the lambda calculus you can think of as an abstract mathematical way of talking about software. And since most of the time we're mainly interested in interacting with software, the lambda calculus is very, very useful. But the pi calculus was supposed to be like the next best thing after the lambda calculus. And it's supposed to take into account communicating computers, basically. Um, now, the lambda calculus has gotten really well understood using category theory now, although I still think it needs more. I still need to do more there. But the pi calculus is more like the Wild West. This guy made up this framework. And if you're a mathematician, you go, ah, what's all this stuff? All these weird primitive concepts that aren't the kind of math concepts I'd ever heard about. And so trying to bring it into the fold of, of other forms of mathematics is, I think, very important. And category theory is flexible enough that it should be able to work, but I don't think it's been done. So that's something we should try to do. And again, it's because computers sort of run the world now. and, and uh, and getting, getting them to work more clearly and know what they're doing more smoothly is, I think, a really great thing that we might be able to make a little bit of progress in. So I hope you come to these seminars and help us figure this stuff out. Um, these slides are available online. You can get them here. This is a fairly short URL. And then all the links in green, except for this one. Uh, are, are, are links to different things like more information. So all these, all these different papers and things are papers that are free online and you can, you can read them. And so we're gonna keep doing this. We're gonna put these, if, if all goes well, we'll put these videos online. And so even if you don't wanna come, you can still, you can still li listen to us here. Uh, and we'll try to make progress on things. We, we have some talks that haven't, we've got more talks sort of cooking after these ones here that haven't quite been scheduled yet. But um, Kenny is going to talk about genetics and category theory. And you are going to talk about what? About uh, the energy systems language. All right, Odom's energy systems language, which was this ch chart that I showed a while back. So, but this should go on next quarter as well, so there should be even more. Ah, where is this? Anyway, it doesn't matter. I know where it is. <laughs> Sorry. I hate it when people do this type of stuff. There, yeah, that, that picture there is an example of Ener Odom's energy systems language. That's just begging to be made mathematical. Okay, I think, well, let's see. Why don't you, well, I'll field questions for a while, yeah or comments. Like, what are you guys doing? Why are you, what, what do you want to do? I don't want to say, okay, that never works. <laughs> Especially when there's a video camera. Well, no, the world will know what I'm thinking. Any questions? You're usually able to come up with some question, questions or comment. Um, so you've established this azimuth community um, yep. Online, how? Um, <clears throat> what were? It's it's become less active over the years, and um, the people are still there and they still care. And how? How do we help to reignite those people and and get them coordinating? Uh, yeah. The so I started out. Yeah. So I started out. Being, getting interested in these environmental issues pretty seriously around 2010. So I set up a, a wiki and an online forum called the Azimuth Forum, the Azimuth Wiki. And, and so then I was working with a bunch of people who were just like random people online who decided to join into this, this project. And there were some, a lot of computer people. Uh, and and the, I guess one of the problems was that the computer people, they love to program. 
That's right. So they say, okay, what are we going to do? Tell me what to do. What are we going to write a program for? And I'll do it. And I, since I just don't think that way, I, I didn't even like, I had a lot of trouble figuring out what to even come up with. So one thing I did come up with is like simple models of climate science that you could actually run on a web browser that would illustrate principles of climate science. So that would be like an educational thing. And it's also like a fairly easy type of program to write if you're a computer programmer. So it's not like a massive program. So we did some things like that. And then we did something where we analyzed a paper that showed up in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where some people were using network methods to try to predict the next El Nino. And this was before the last El Nino. So everyone was like wondering when it was going to happen. And we basically read, it was a fairly simple project. We basically redid their analysis uh, and like learned a whole bunch in the process because it involved like getting lots of data of sea surface temperatures and things like that and analyzing them and things like that. Um, so, and, that, and that involves some, some coding, so the, the programmers were, were happy, happy to do that. But, I, <coughs> but when I came back to UC Riverside, I felt that that, that kind of way of proceeding was, wasn't, really wasn't igniting at the rate that I wanted it to be. And so that's when I sort of shifted gears, because I realized that, I mean, the great thing about academia is, is that you have people who are sort of paid to think full-time, more or less full-time, about, about stuff. And the great thing about having grad students is grad students are just there saying like, okay, tell me something cool to do and I'll start doing it. Whereas all these other people were like computer programmers who are really busy and would say like, you know, uh, I can do this now, but uh, then you know, for a few months I can't be around, stuff like that. Um, and also, because I'm hooked into mathematical academia and I'm not hooked into computation and other things like that. So I just re, so I basically said like, ah, the Azimuth Project is going it's to be a new thing now. It's going to be, it's going to turn into applied category theory. So, and so the, all the old folks sort of dissipated because it was, it was like such a different, such a different game. And then I taught this course in applied category theory from March to September online, where I got 350 people who registered for the course. It's hard to know how many actually paid attention. Uh, and there too, they sort of dissipated when it was over because I didn't, I wasn't smart enough to like figure it out like, okay, what do you do after the course? Um, I'm hoping that some of them will reawaken when they see these lectures. They're, they're, I mean, they should be interested in, in, in these type of lectures. Not so much this lecture, but the, the more category theory. But I, th yeah, so I think to me it's a somewhat unsolved problem how to, how to combine working with academic colleagues, which is something I know how to do, and it's just like what you've got to learn to do to succeed in academia, how to combine that with like reaching out outside academia and getting other people involved. There are lots of people floating around who are like really good in academic disciplines who then wound up working for industry who want to get back into doing something that's more, a bit more like academia as a side project. And they tend to be really smart people, some of them, and, and they can do amazing stuff, you know, like, you know, like great computer programmers. But figuring out how to, how to get it to happen, what, what it should be, <laughs> what, what, what kind of project can be ongoing that can continue while various people may come and go. It's just, I haven't really, I don't feel like I've really worked it out yet. And how to get the more science-minded people connected with the more activism-minded people. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So there was, so it certainly attracted some activism-minded people, but it would just, you know, it was very hard to hook up to anything that they could do other than if they weren't also doing things able to do scientific stuff. That's right. Yeah. So we didn't have like azimuth rallies or azimuth clubs or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so probably there it's just better to hook on to some other existing activist organization because there, there's some kind of people who are good at like running activist organizations and that just like no 
good at that at all. So I've slowly learned that like it's really probably good to like hook on to other things that people are doing things that no one's doing.